Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have a real treat. We're going to be talking about the power of community and the power of in-person events. And we actually have three guests here today. So we have the creators of Camp Fi, Stephen Boyer, the Economy Conference, Diana Merriam, and the Fi Freedom Retreat, Amy Minkley. And we're just going to have a wonderful and far-ranging conversation on how can in-person events change your life? How can they support you on your path to FI at every stage? And I think this is going to be really valuable for everyone who has either been at an event and wonder what they can do maybe to get a little more out of it the next time, or that person who's really on the fence about it. They're on the couch. They're wondering, should I get up and travel to one of these events? What am I going to get out of it? Is it really going to be worth it? So I think this is going to be fun. And with that, welcome to Choose FI. All right, my friends, thank you for being here. So Diana and Amy, you have been on the podcast. And Stephen, incredibly, this is your first appearance on Choose of I, even though I have probably mentioned you 50 to 100 times over the years about Camp Fi. So thank you, my friend, for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be fun. All right, so Stephen, why don't we start with you? I hate the phrase elevator pitch, but let's go with that. So if you were to describe to somebody, hey, why should you attend an in-person event? What are you going to get out of it? Is it really worth it? I need to take two or three days out of my life. I have to travel. I have to spend some money. Is this really worth it? What do you tell people? What I would tell somebody who's considering whether or not to come is ask yourself why you aren't already doing the things that you want to do. Why are you even considering it in the first place? Because oftentimes we can read blog posts. We can listen to podcasts. We have all of the information that we need to take action, but we still don't take action. And I'll say one of the biggest things about in-person connections and relationships is that is the difference between knowing and actually doing. Once you spend some time and get connected and get energized by people in this community, they will undoubtedly give you the confidence that you need to take that next step and start moving in the direction that maybe you've been procrastinating on or just haven't had the confidence enough to take action on. So I would say for me and for a lot of people, that's probably the biggest reason to come out and get connected in person. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. The difference between knowing and actually doing. And Amy, I think you're probably uniquely qualified to follow that up, right? So to go from knowing to doing, I know you have done a lot of doing in the last couple of years and in-person events have really helped galvanize and given you some, some push behind your five path. Uh, Definitely. I mean, when I found the FI path, you know, it's through your brother, Brad, and it was in the midst of the pandemic. I was feeling very isolated at the time. And my dream was to come back to the U.S. and experience community that I heard about when I was hearing about economy. I heard Diana and I heard about Camp FI and Stephen. So as soon as I could get back to the U.S. in October of, you know, 2021, you know, if you look at that picture from that camp, I had a massive smile on my face because I felt like I found my tribe. And as Stephen had said, you know, I learned from the podcast and the books, but really going to that camp and having two people sit down with me and look at my numbers and my spreadsheet and my asset allocation and give me like personal advice. And I just left my job in Bangkok. I was scared. I was, you know, dealing with mindset issues of like, what have I done? You know, people coaching me through the mindset piece of it too. And, you know, I've since benefited even the last year and a half, people coaching me around my finances, the nuts and bolts of it, but also the mindset of it. So this community is so supportive, so giving, so generous. And, you know, these relationships just deepen. I mean, I went to nine events in 18 months. I was so excited to find this community. So I just feel the more events I attend, the deeper the relationships, the more I find the sense of belonging and excitement about my life. So it's really motivated me on my journey and given me new ideas. So you never know who you'll meet. You never know what kind of opportunity will come into you know your environment. I got a job at a Camp Fi as well. So <laughs> there's so many great opportunities going to an in-person <laughs> event. Wow. So you got a job at one of the Camp Fies? Yeah, the very first Camp Fi Southwest. Yeah, I'm still working. I tutor online teaching kids in California. And I met the owner of the company at Camp Fi. And I know a lot of people have gotten a job. In fact, someone just got a job at my retreat working for Joe at Second Benjamins. 
So it's just, you just never know what kind of connections are going to come out of these in-person events. Yeah, that's serendipity. I think it's so important. So I definitely want to come back to you, Amy, and talk about, so nine events in 18 months. That's really interesting because, right, I think I set this up as why would you come to your first event? But then the question is, why would you come to your second, your fifth, your eighth, your ninth? And that's that's really interesting. So we're going to double back to you, but I want to go over to Diana. Diana, I feel like you have such an eloquent way of, of summarizing things. Talk me through your elevator pitch for why would you come to an event? What do you get out of it personally, but probably more importantly, what can someone expect to get out of an in-person event? Sure. And there's so many different directions that we could go with this. So I'm so (laughs) glad that we have time to really dig in. I think one element that stands out to me is that on a very deep level, we are hardwired for human connection, right? I think we all crave a sense of belonging. I think it's very important for our well-being. And many of us within the FI community are getting that need met through online communities, which, you know, I've been following this since 2015. I didn't go to my first in-person event in the FI community until 2019. I went to Camp Mustache in Seattle. And I could just notice for myself that my FI journey like significantly shifted after I was able to connect with people in person. And when I kind of think about the difference of before and after I started going to events, I can't be alone in recognizing that there's a certain amount of efficiency through online connection, right? You shoot someone a text, you participate in a discussion online. There's a an optimization there, right? You're getting information very quickly. You're able to communicate with people that maybe you wouldn't be able to interact with on a day-to-day basis. But while there's efficiency, there's also a loss of energy on some level that I can't fully explain. And so I have found some of the online interaction very draining. I found myself reading a ton, but not really participating. And so when it comes to in-person events, it's almost like I gave myself more permission to participate and I ended up getting a lot more out of it. Yeah, that's cool. And I can definitely echo that. I think clearly the online communities are wonderful. I mean, obviously we have a, a large Facebook group for Jews of High. We have the, the local groups that are the online versions, but there's just something indescribable about those in-person meetups that, that just make a difference. But frankly, the different type of in-person meetups matter as well. And I think this is something, Diana, I wanted to talk to you about because I think the Cincinnati Phi and Choose a Phi local group has done something really extraordinary recently that has kind of changed the game for all the local groups that that I hope to implement across many of the local groups, if not all of them across the world. And that's actually doing a case study. So I think for the handful of years that these local groups have existed, most meetups have just been very informal get-togethers. They've been, hey, let's go to a brewery or something similar. Let's stand around and talk for an hour or two. And that is wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm not discounting that because I think people have made significant connections, but I think there's a next step. Now, obviously, we can talk about your three events for those next steps because I think that's important and we will go there. But let's start with these case studies that you're doing in Cincinnati yeah. because I, I think you've hit on something really special. Well, where that started, and basically what a case study is, is one volunteer puts together a presentation of their income, their expenses, their investment strategy, kind of where they stand today, their assumptions, and the plan they've put together to reach FI. And they kind of open it up to an audience to uncover blind spots, provide validation. You know, it really generates such a fruitful discussion. And the reason why I started doing this is because my first FI event that I went to, Camp Mustache, we had a session of attendee case studies where I put my numbers up there. And it was the first time I really shared my numbers. And you know, I was doing this on my own for years, just putting together my own plan based on what I read. And I had so much anxiety around it that I didn't realize. And part of the case study is at the end, it's like, what questions do you have for the group? And I had things on there like, did I calculate this one little thing correctly? And am I optimizing in this area? And like, what about tax loss harvesting? Like that intimidates me. And I'm not sure that like, like, shouldn't I be doing that? I felt like I wasn't doing enough. And the amount of just comfort I got from this room of people, many of which I felt were so much more experienced than me, 
And they were able to kind of be like, you've got this. And not just kind of patting me on the back and saying, you got this. Like in-depth discussions around why they felt I didn't need to worry about X, Y, or Z. Like they were just so convincing. And I walked away from that with such a level of comfort that I never had in my years before in participating in like just reading things online. And so I think that's a big difference in what I experience at events as well as there's the objective on paper, what your numbers are and what your plan is. And again, we all want to optimize. We all want to be efficient. But then there's the way you feel about your numbers. And it's almost like these case studies become a form of financial therapy because usually the things that we're concerned about on the surface aren't really the issue. The issue is underneath the issue. And it's really about you know how we feel about what we're working towards. And it amazes me in these case studies. And we've been doing this for about a year in Cincinnati. And we have multimillionaires in the room who look up at the screen of their numbers on the screen and all they feel is anxiety. And it feels like madness to me because (laughs) they have so much money, but what they lack is a comfort level around their money. And I think that they walk away with more comfort. Yeah, that's right, Diana. I'm seeing the same thing at Camp Fi. Something that we've been doing probably for about a year now is on one of the nights at Camp Fi, we will do a case study where I'll ask two or three people, volunteers, to participate in a case study. What we'll do is just a big group thing. We'll put together a panel, a very informal panel of some people usually that I choose out of the group that I think would be good on the panel to listen, to review a volunteer situation if they have a certain question that they want answered, a certain life situation they want help getting perspective on. And I'm seeing the same thing. You know, a lot of people in these groups are very well off and they're doing great. And for whatever reason, they just don't feel like they are or they have anxieties, like you say, about their situation and they get value out of sharing their numbers, not necessarily like a bragging way, but just like, this is what it is. This is our reality. These are our concerns. And after the panel speaks, if there's some extra time in that little session, you know, maybe the audience will uh, share some tidbits of support or information for the volunteer. And also one of the things that came to mind whenever I was listening to you answer Brad's question was that something that community gives you, and Brad is a perfect example of this for me, is that say that person comes, they come to a Choose FI meetup in Cincinnati and they do a case study, or they come to Economy or they go to Bali or Five Freedom Retreat. But what they're doing is they are being a little bit vulnerable, which opens them up, but it also allows for that deeper connection. And Somebody might say, oh, you know, have you heard of travel hacking? I hear you're, you're wanting to go travel for whatever reason. And they're like, no, I haven't. So one of the things community does for me and probably for a lot of people is that I don't have to know everything about a certain subject. That person doesn't have to know everything about travel hacking. They just know somebody who does now in person. And so for me, one of the things that I was a little intimidated about at the start of being introduced to the FI community, everything way back in 2015 was travel hacking. It was like, oh, a lot of people are doing this. I'm kind of a smart guy. I think I should be able to figure it out, but I'm still intimidated. So that's actually one of the reasons why I had Brad come and speak at the very first camp that I organized. I don't know if Brad remembers. I do. I probably reached out in like 2016. He was probably like, who's this crazy guy? Send him an email <laughs> about some event that he's doing. But I just wanted to learn about travel hacking. But even after learning what Brad had to teach at that event, I didn't know everything, but I knew I had somebody. So, you know, picture like a dark bridge. I can take that first step and like I get back to the dark spot. I can call Brad to shed some light on the path again. And like I can get further down that path. And so that's one of the good things that A, making yourself vulnerable to allow people to know what you need or what you want and what direction you're heading to allow them to kind of shine the flashlights along your path. Yeah, I love that, Stephen. So, Amy, Stephen described being vulnerable, and I think that's so important, but I think that is hard for some people. And I'm curious if you have any any tips because you've gotten so much value from being vulnerable, right? You've you've made connections, you opened up both about the mindset and the numbers. But how does someone who might feel a little uncomfortable, maybe they consider themselves, I don't know, an introvert or for whatever we call that, like they're just not comfortable. How do they make that leap? Or what would you counsel someone? I would say, you know, I've, I've learned from my experience that the conversation that I'm most afraid to have is the conversation I most need to have. And anytime something's in my head and, you know, I've, I've experienced, I've shared with you before, 
Brad, about, you know, I was going with, through depression and anxiety in Bangkok when I found the fire movement, but it was all up in my head. You know, I was afraid to share it with people. And I was really suffering during that time. And the moment I started really sharing that with people, you know, I heard, you know, from so many people, like I've experienced that too. And I suddenly didn't feel so alone. And the same thing with opening up my fears around money and my, my money wound. You know, I was just thinking back to a conversation that we had at Five Freedom, a couple of us sitting around one night. I was like sharing that often I, I worry what, what other people think of me. I, I worry if I, do people really like me when they, when I meet someone at a campfire and they invite me to their house, you know, or invite me to visit them in their city. Is that a genuine invitation? Or are they just being nice? You know, you know, I, I think back to most of my life being scared of really connecting deeply with people. And I think by sharing those fears, you know, suddenly I feel less alone and I know that it opens up other people to be more vulnerable. So I guess I would counsel someone to find someone you trust because, you know, you don't want to be vulnerable with the wrong people, (laughs) but, you know, find someone that you trust and sharing the inner workings of what you're thinking. And often the feedback that you might receive is other people are having similar fears that you may be having and you feel less, for me, at least I feel less alone it's no longer, it doesn't have the same grip on me when it's experienced out. And I, I would build on kind of what Amy's saying. The first thing that came to mind as she was describing her experience is the Phi community is so incredibly warm. And I don't know if you can really feel that warmth through a screen. I also think that in person, there is almost like more time and space for nuance in a way that I haven't seen online because I think in person you feel more permission to be vulnerable. So I'll give you like, we're talking about all this stuff on like high level. I feel like we need like a more concrete example. So I'll be a little vulnerable in sharing this. Recently, I saw in, I think it was the Choose Fi group, you know, someone was talking about credit card hacking and I've got all these cards open and I'm thinking of closing all of these cards, including like the oldest card that I have open. And there's like a hundred comments of don't close that card. You know, it's important to like keep your oldest card open. And I'm reading all of this and I almost wanted to encourage and I didn't participate again because I didn't feel comfortable participating because on a surface level, yes, they are correct. But from my own experience, what I noticed is I like way overextended myself on credit card hacking. I wasn't organized enough consistently. I was forgetting to downgrade or close cards before the yearly fee. I was, no one talked about this, but if you keep like 20 cards open, you have to monitor them all for fraud. I kept running into things where like I wasn't paying attention to a card for a long time. It didn't have a fee. And then there would be a fraudulent charge and I wouldn't catch it in time. And it just created a mess, right? So I was dealing with my own mess around cards that didn't necessarily line up with the most optimal way of thinking about it. But it was because of my own disorganization and like not keeping up on it. And that's embarrassing to admit in a public written forum, right? Whereas in person, I feel more comfortable admitting that and kind of getting a little solidarity around like, you know, when you speak in generalities, it makes sense. But when you boil down to the nuance of everyday life and how we actually behave, some of those things might not necessarily apply. Yeah, I agree. And there is just something about sitting there with somebody. And we're talking about, in this case, credit card rewards. And just being honest about, you you can't just lurk. I think that's Mm. one of the biggest aspects, right? Like you're sitting there in person with someone, you're having a conversation, you clearly cannot just lurk behind a screen. And then to add on to that is you want to be involved. You want to be open. Like I find that, I find myself answering things that I'm probably, I would have thought that I wasn't comfortable talking about, but it always feels good. I don't even know how to describe it. I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words here, but but it does feel good in some indescribable way to just be open. Because I think we just, we kind of like hoard all this information to ourselves. Like we don't want to talk about it. We're embarrassed. Even if things are good, like you're saying, Diana, before about there are multimillionaires who just feel nervous. They feel unsettled with their money. And sometimes it does just take that financial therapy. And I think there's just something really important there. Yeah. And I'm just thinking what you're saying, Brad, and and also Diana and Steven, you know, I think what's so special about these in-person events is that they're multiple day. 
because I know, you know, the meetups are awesome and I love the meetups and I've gone to meetups, you know, all over the world. And I go to, when I go to Australia and they're, they're really great, but I notice I have a hard time being vulnerable just when I meet someone. And, you know, Diane, I think what you've done in your meetup in Cincinnati, I think is probably unusual because you've really built a structure there where people are able to go deep in the first meetup. And then because they're really getting their needs met, you get the same consistent people, I'm guessing, attending, you know, I don't know if you have it, you know, a couple of times a month or once a month, but I imagine you've really built a strong sense of community there. And I'm not sure that's always the case because I know for myself, if I go to a, you know, a meetup that's happening once a month, you know, I'm just going to have the, the surface level, you know, what's your job, how long you've been traveling, that kind of conversation. And so I think what's beautiful is intentional conversations that allow vulnerability. And that either has to be intentionally created at a meetup with some structure, or I find there's some beautiful thing that happens on the second day of an event. And the third day and the fourth day, it just goes deeper and deeper the longer people are together. And that real human need that Diana spoke about, we're hardwired for community, is met when you're with the same people through a multi-day event and you really have a lot of time together. Yeah, those intentional conversations. That's another important phrase, intentional conversations. And and clearly, I, as I guess the co-founder of Choose If I, will take some of the blame for, I guess, the lack of of having those type of case studies and and very intentional things at these local groups, because to a large degree, we wanted them to be decentralized and autonomous, right? Every group could kind of do their own thing. And I think there is a lot of value to that. And certainly many of these groups across the world have taken that and run with it and, and had a lot of these real connections. But Amy, what you just described, I think is something I've seen in my own local group is, hey, we get together at a brewery, maybe three or four times a year, and it's always different people. And then it's just that same surface level conversation. Whereas if you essentially regroup and start from a smaller nucleus, and then it can just build from there, but it builds from that level of comfort and really deeply knowing each other. So I, I think there's really something there. And Diana, just going back to your case study, I, I think it's really something important. And I know when we spoke in person, actually we met at the, uh, recently at the FinCon conference and had a 90 minute conversation, which is amazing. But we talked about, there's just something about this case study thing that I, I really want to implement in every choose of a local group. So I think we've really got something there. But Stephen, I, I wanted to get back to you. You now, at least by my count, you are finishing your seventh year of hosting events. So 2017 through 2023. And I'm not sure exactly how many events you've hosted, but it's got to be north of 30, could be significantly higher than that. What have you seen change over the years with either the people attending or just the FI community or, or the overall concept of what people are, are bringing to these events. I, I'm curious, have you noticed a change? I don't want to put words in your mouth first. I think from the perspective of Camp Phi, not a lot has changed. I know we like to think, you know, we all have been part of the Phi community for years. And so we as individuals probably have changed throughout, you know, our, our life or over that time of being exposed to the community. But from the lens of just the event of Camp Phi, it's a place for people of all all phases in their FI journey to get together. So we always have people who are in debt. We always have people who are already financially independent and everything in between with a varied amount of backgrounds. And so I don't think the people, like as far as like a, like a cross section or whatever, I don't think that there's any sort of major demographic type changes from Camp FI. I think that early on, a lot of the topics were more technical. I think more recently, a lot of the talks and topics have been for quality of life type talks. So maybe in that way, but I don't know if that's a reflection of the fact that any given camp, instead of having you know, 80% new people, we're starting to have 50, 60% returnees and 40% new people. So of course, that conversation at camps are going to change. But I'll reiterate, camps are not just for people who've been to one before. It's not a click. It's actually interesting. I think maybe over the, the 42 camps that I've done, over the last seven years, I think I would say that one of the really cool things is that even though the percentage of returnees are getting a little bit higher, typically, which is great, one of the things that I really like is that the people who have been to a number of camps don't just stay in their group with the people that they've met before. Like they go out of their way and they make sure they have dinner with the new people and they make sure that they make time 
and they, you know, they're jumping from table to table every meal so that they can mingle with everybody. And so if you're considering coming to a campfire, you've sort of been on the sidelines and, and you know, it's been going on for a while and you might have in your head that it's just now sort of like this uh, insider club thing of people who just know each other already. It's really not. There are a lot of camps and there are a lot of people and it's just, you're going to feel welcome when you come. And yet, Diana, that was one thing that I was really hardened by at Economy. So Economy 2023 was actually, crazily enough, the first post-COVID live event that I've been to. And in all honesty, I didn't know what to expect just generally about Economy, which I subsequently found out I've coined is the largest FI gathering in the world. It was just extraordinary in every way. But I was shocked at how many new people there were to the community who came to the event. And it, it just, I don't know what I feared. I think on some level, I feared that that new people weren't still finding the FI community en masse, but that was quickly put to bed when I showed up at Economy and, and just heard these amazing stories of, I mean, by the dozens of people who were brand new. And I think what Steven said was, maybe we have changed. And that's the cool thing is each of us are at a different point in our FI journey. I'm at a different point, certainly than I was in 2017 when I went to my first Camp Fi, which was called Camp Mustache back then. And I feel a little different, but it, it's wonderful to see all these new people. I, I love if you had any thoughts on, on just this whole evolution, but just really the fact that new people are still finding Fi. I mean, by the bucket load, it's remarkable. Yeah. Well, I think that the concept of fire attracts a really special kind of person, a really genuine, authentic kind of person. And even more so, when it comes to in-person events, because it doesn't take a lot of effort to join an online forum or a Facebook group, but it actually takes a ton of effort to find childcare, to take time off of work, to buy a plane ticket, to be out of your environment. Like I think the kind of people that would go to an in-person event and exhibit that kind of effort are people that really care and are very intentional about the way they live their lives. I mean, think about how intentional we are about how we spend money, about what we put in our bodies and what we eat and how we exercise. But when it comes to human connection and relationships, a lot of us are subject to who's conveniently around us, right? We're friends with our neighbors. We're friends with the people we went to school with or the people that we work with. But to get on a plane and like very specifically seek out the kind of people you want to influence you and surround yourself with, I think is um is a big statement of what kind of person you are. And so I just find that I'm always wowed by like the quality of people that show up to these events. They're extremely intelligent, extremely creative, and very generous. And when you combine those three things, it's like you are bound to walk away learning something new, and feeling a sense of reinvigoration about your fire path. Like I always say, come to economy to fuel your fire because fire is better with friends. It just simply is. Yeah. Yeah. I love also just how intelligent and creative people are. It is astonishing. I mean, you can sit at any given table at any of these events and just be blown away. Like it's funny because I guess obviously on some level, I'm well known in this community because of this podcast, but I always feel like, why is anybody asking me questions? I, I have nothing to add compared to just the wealth of knowledge. So that's what's great. And, and I'm saying that obviously self-deprecatingly, but there is some truth to it in the sense that like you get just an extraordinary, extraordinary type of person to show up to these events because like you said, it is self-selecting. And Amy, I think I want to talk to you about self-selection because you just ran your first event in Bali, Indonesia, which takes an altogether different level of self-selection for someone to take essentially with travel and such at least a week out of their life to travel maybe halfway around the world. I'd love to hear, well, A, just a little bit about the event. The last time we talked to you, so this was the very first Five Freedom Retreat. Tell us how it went. Give us an update and talk about maybe that type of person who's maybe looking for something a little bit different, maybe a, an adventure. I don't know how you even would conceptualize it, but talk us through it. Yeah. Like Diana said, I was surprised at people coming from a distance and it was their first FI event. So I had six people who'd never been to Camp FI or Economy. I was, I was surprised. I'm like, how did you find me? A lot of people heard on podcasts. 
but yeah, a lot of people traveled very far and I just have to hand it to them. And I did not take it lightly that they would spend their time and hard earned money to come all the way to Bali. Sometimes for, you know, they don't know me at all, but it was a great event. I mean, we did, I really wanted people to get full value and I love Bali. You know, I've lived in Asia for 22 years, but Bali is my chosen home and the place I've lived for many years now. So I really wanted to have a lot of pre and post events. You know, the five day retreat was awesome. I was really happy with all the speakers. I really wanted to honor Bali. So I brought in, you know, a Balinese speaker who's doing amazing work on the island, helping women who've been in domestic violence situation, children with disabilities. You know, I was able to give part of my proceeds to them. And then we raised money for the center. We did a lot pre and post event biking, hiking volcanoes. We went to an island for over a week. So people came not for a week. Some people stayed for four to five weeks and we did a lot. We went rafting. We went, you know, water temple ceremony blessings. We went to like a sustainable village tourism initiative. There was a lot of time, you know, there, of course, the speakers were awesome. The breakout sessions were great, but there was a lot of time sitting around the pool, having meals together on excursions, exploring Bali together as a group. And so it really gave people a huge opportunity to really bond, uh, develop deeper friendships and have those conversations in a more vulnerable level because they really got to know each other in a very deep way. Yeah. I mean, that sounds remarkable. And I think what you just hit on about kind of comparing the formal portion of each of these events and the informal, right? The sitting around, the meals, the downtime. And I know... It sounds like, obviously, Amy, I, I didn't attend, but, but I've attended both Camp Fi and Economy. And I know both Stephen and Diana have went out of their way to add in a lot of these unstructured times. It's interesting, right? Like there's so much value to be had from hearing a speaker or having a workshop. But I think the magic happens, at least for me, in the downtime. So I, I'm curious if any of you want, want to jump in on that on how do you structure this? Like, how do you think about, okay, clearly I don't want to just say, here's 16 waking hours, go talk, right? Like that doesn't make for an event, but understanding that, that a lot of that unstructured time is really where the magic happens. Yeah. So early on, uh, whenever I was looking at how I was going to sort of schedule out the weekend for Camp Fi, I did have a somewhat a template from attending a Camp Mustache in 2016. So I took that experience and then sort of tweaked it to what I would like more of. And one of those things was establishing a little bit more formal so that we could relax even more when it was off. So what I mean by that is, you know, it's good for people to have shared experiences as a group. It gives people something to talk about, something to connect with, but then you can go and sort of talk about what the speaker said. But for me, and I think for a lot of people, we don't want to go to like a conference where we're just getting fed information like a fire hose where we just can't process any of it, you know, where every minute is scheduled out and it's talk after talk after talk and everybody's writing notes and, and everything. And then you're just exhausted. So I think a good balance for me, and I was hoping at the time for other people would be have some good, solid, formal-ish shared experiences with some downtime where you can go and take a rest, where you can communicate with other people and bond over what you just learned. And it just seemed to work. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Economy is structured pretty similarly in that we have something to kind of get the ball rolling and then you let people take it from there. So like, for example, we kick off Friday night leading into the weekend with a speed friendshipping session <laughs> that you co-hosted with me, yeah, Brad, last that was time. Fun. And from my post-event survey, this was the favorite activity of the weekend. Because yeah. many people are showing up alone, right? And they feel a little intimidated. I mean, we had over 400 people at the last economy conference. It's a little intimidating to walk into a room, especially if you're an introvert, and just say, okay, I'm going to make friends, right? Despite how warm the environment and the crowd is, that still is a little challenging. And so we were able to facilitate kind of group discussions where you were going to meet that first night 14 people that then you would probably be more likely to be comfortable going up to them the rest of the weekend during some of those more free form open times. And people pay to go to these events. Again, this is a frugal community, right? These are people that are very intentional about how they spend money. What you're paying for 
is to participate in the community. When it comes to like a lot of the formal presentations, and I do challenge myself to like really bring in provocative content that maybe you wouldn't hear elsewhere. I want people to feel like they learned something new. And that's going to happen regardless, whether it's from a formal presentation or it's just from a side conversation that you have. You're going to walk away with learning something new. But I very intentionally put all of the videos of the main stage speeches online because I feel like if that's the number one thing that you want, I will give that to you for free. Don't buy a ticket for that, right? Because I think it's so important that you're getting the appropriate amount of value for the money that you're spending. And so I want you participating in the community if you're going to attend. So that's why I give those presentations away for free. But you just, you know, I I feel like we are hitting it from so many angles. It's like everyone says community matters, but like when you really dive into it, it's just, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Like I think about, you know, when you listen to your favorite band at home, yeah, that's great. You enjoy the music. But wouldn't we all agree that watching them live in concert in a crowd just is a different, more impactful experience? Same thing with watching a movie, right? You go and and watch a movie in a packed theater, your experience is altered by the energy in the room. And every event I have gone to you know, I've watched maybe a TED Talk online, but then I went and actually saw TED Talks live. It's just a completely different experience. And I think it helps you integrate what you're learning in a new and different way. Yeah. Altered by the energy in the room. That is so true. There is something deeply fundamentally true about that. And I think those examples you used are absolutely perfect. And I think what we did with the Speed Friendship was it gave people a home base, right? It gave people... 14 others that, okay, this is my home base. When I look out on this room of 400 people, I'm going to feel comfortable going up and and speaking with them. So I I think that was good. And and frankly, Amy, you and I hit on something, I think in the breakout session at Economy that you were nice enough to help me with. I think what we did was we made it really about the people attending that. It wasn't a presentation. It was, okay, we're going to talk for a few minutes and give you a prompt. And then we broke everybody up into these little groups and it was about taking action. What actions are you going to take? And we made them accountability groups and we offered share your information and hopefully you're going to keep in touch with this small little group of four and make it accountability partners. And that's what I would advise anybody to do. I think that to me is like the running theme here is be open, be vulnerable, talk about real things and rely on other people and have them rely on you. This is not just show up and have a beer and talk about where you went on your last trip. You can do that with anybody on earth, right? Phi community events are special because, and precisely because we're being open. We're willing to be that little bit vulnerable. And yeah, I mean, Amy, I thought, I don't know how, what the alchemy was that we came up with that, but that worked out marvelously. Yeah. And I I feel like that's important. You know, I I mentioned speakers earlier, but really having facilitators leading the audience through discussions at Five Freedom, a lot of the facilitators were giving prompts to the audience. They were writing notes, you know, they were journaling, they were turning and talking, they were in groups of four, they had accountability groups. So I think the more that we set up situations where the audience is really grappling with the information instead of passively listening. I think it's helpful as well, because I know that helps me. And, you know, I was a teacher for a lot of years. So like the more that I could get the students talking to each other, or, you know, the more opportunities we can give in our events for people to talk to each other and learn from each other. Because, you know, as Diana says, like, there's so much knowledge in the room, so much warmth and support. Yeah, actually... And I feel like Stephen needs a turn because I tend to talk too much. Um, But riff off of this, Stephen. So it's funny, Amy, that you mention all this because literally as we're talking, I get an email that comes in and I shouldn't have checked it, but it just, I got a (laughs) notification. And it's from someone who just signed up for the economy conference. And she says, I'm registered for the upcoming conference with my sister. I'm extremely new to the idea of Phi and I'm worried I'm going to be too much of a newbie to relate to everyone. Is there any room at the conference for someone who's just getting started? How amazing for this email to pop up as we're having this discussion, because I really do think that there is room for everyone. I've seen it myself. And what I love about in-person events is I think it highlights 
the diversity in the movement that you may not realize when you read about it online. I know for myself, I got this perception that like everyone was so buttoned up and everybody knows more than me. And so I don't, I might not fit in. But especially from seeing these case studies, like I feel like I have a front row seat to how diverse the movement actually is and how um, the reality is this stuff is kind of messy. And when you look at online versions that are very polished, it gives you the perception that everyone is further along than you or knows more than you. But I think when you really dig into the messiness by, let's say, looking at a case study, I mean, I'm amazed sometimes at like how far along people are on their path to FI and they never heard of like a backdoor Roth and we like blow their minds while they're presenting their numbers, right? Like it's just we're all at a different place in our journey. We've all been exposed to different information and really, I don't think there's any right way to pursue FI, even though there's a perception that there's like a way to do this. I think the only thing all of us actually agree on is to spend less than you earn and invest the difference. That's our like one mutual thing that I think we can all agree on. Everything else is up for debate. And that that I think is what makes these events so robust and what has us keep coming back. Like I've been to 10 Camp Fives or 11 Camp Fives or something like that. Like most people would say, didn't you, you got what you needed out of it. You learned what you needed to learn. But no, it's like every time I go, I learn something new or I'm exposed to a way of thinking that alters my path. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. It's remarkable that you did just get that email. That's great. Uh, I, I get emails like that as well. But I'll say is if you are, again, if you haven't attended one of these things and you think you might be not far enough along, then that is where you need to be. You do need to go. I want Camp Fi to be something. And I'm sure, Diana, you want the economy to be this. And Amy, you want Fi Freedom Retreat to be this. But you want something that can provide a lot of value. And in my mind, the people that can get the most value are people who are currently disconnected from the community, people who might feel anxious about their seemingly like insurmountable path to financial independence, people who are just newly exposed to all of this whole FI concept. So those are the people who are going to get the most value. Now, it doesn't mean that Diana, you've been to a number of camp fives. Amy, you've been to a number of camp fives. I've been to a number of economies. We still get value out of these things. But to me, the most value is those people who come for that first time because it's just like something changes. And being plugged into this community and being connected, it just really does open up a ton of possibility and the feeling of possibility that you might not otherwise have received. And so you just think so much is possible. All those ideas that you've been holding off on or all those steps that you haven't taken, like now you know that it's going to be okay, most likely, if you start moving in that direction. And it's just, to me, that's just the value of what these events bring. I actually thought it would be fun to maybe go around and provide examples of like things that we've seen of attendees getting a ton of value. Because that Ooh. to me is like the most exciting part of producing an event is seeing the impact, is seeing that, you know, we all recognize that we want to spend money on what we value. We want to get the appropriate amount of value out of the money that we're spending. And when I get notes from people that are like, this far exceeded my expectations, I got so much more out of it than I thought I would. And just hearing those stories like always blow me away. So I'd love to hear from you guys, like what you've seen come out of this form of in-person connection. Yeah, I love that. And while you're thinking of that, I just wanted to just quickly chime in on what Stephen just said. It, it's, it really is a judgment-free zone. I think a lot of us, Diana, like you said, everybody thinks, oh, everybody else is all buttoned up. They have it all figured out. Nobody has it figured out. We're all just imperfect humans and we're trying to just live the best life we can. And like Amy said much earlier in the conversation, the conversation you're most scared of is the one you need the most, right? So I think if that gives you that little push, that little impetus to get up off the couch and attend one of these events, it's precisely because you're scared. That's why you should do it. So anyway, that's my little interlude for uh, for the thinking break. Who has an example of, of something really tangible that people have taken away? I know something that I like to think about. There was an instance with Camp Fi early on. There was a, a woman who attended and she was more, as is often the case, whenever you have couples, there's going to be one that's sort of 
super gung ho, let's do the financial independence thing. And then you have the one that might be less on board. And this was the case. And so she brought her significant other. And at the beginning of the weekend, you could tell he wasn't super comfortable. He was skeptical. He didn't know really what he had gotten himself into or what his his partner had brought him to. And then by the end of the weekend, he was interacting, looking like he was enjoying himself. And later on, I crossed paths with her at a FinCon and she stopped and told me that before that weekend, she wasn't sure they would ever see eye to eye on money and their money philosophies. And that put a potential wedge between them, like a concern that she had. She wasn't sure, you know, about long term with their relationship. But after that weekend, you know, she told me later on at FinCon that they had got engaged. So she got comfortable enough with their different financial, I guess, philosophies to move their relationship further. So to me, I mean, I think I remember, I think I teared up when she was telling me that because that's huge. Yeah, that is that's huge. Amazing. You know, um, a lot of people, I guess, when they don't see eye to eye money wise, they might have like underlying tensions in their relationship that eventually cause it to end. And so to be able to find someone that you can connect with either initially or in their case, eventually through attending a camp and have confidence moving forward in the relationship and making it more serious. I think at the time she told me they were they were engaged. So to me, that's something I got a lot of value out of hearing it. And it appears that their relationship got a lot of value as well. Yeah. Amazing. I guess I'll chime in because I, I feel like I put everyone on the spot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but along the same kind of vein as Stephen, you know, again, it is all about community and relationships. And I have this belief that like the person you partner up with, your spouse is probably one of the most important decisions of your life. Like I think there's, we all kind of recognize that's a big decision, right? And the idea that you could like find your spouse, you know, or someone that you're going to like build a life with at one of these events. I have multiple examples of people meeting this way. So there's one couple that met at the 2020 event. And then in 2021, you know, seeing them show up hand in hand, they had just moved in together. Now they've just like moved across the country together. Like I think about them and it makes me like really proud to have created something that could facilitate that level of connection. I know of another couple that actually had their first date at a camp fi and now they're like traveling the world together. Like it just, I don't know why, like it just makes me want to crash all these weddings <laughs> because it's just, maybe I'm just a hopeless romantic, but I know it's something that is like discussed a lot in the fire community. Like how can I find someone, you know, if I'm on the fire path, like how do I find someone compatible? Get on a plane and like put yourself in the room with people that have this mutual interest because I just think it could go a long way. Yeah, agreed. And Amy, obviously, at the time of recording, your event ended less than four weeks ago. So I don't imagine you have uh, tons of stories. But I'm curious, either A, from your event, or B, just from events you've you've been to. You talked about getting jobs potentially from from events. Do you have any a story or two that, that might be of interest? Yeah, first, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the three of you and what you've created. Because you know, I mean, Stephen, like to start with you, like 42 events, it's phenomenal. And when I came to my first Camp Fi, I signed up for right after that, I'm going to go to Camp Fi Texas, and I'm going to go to Camp Fi Florida. And, you know, the impact that you have had over 42 events over a lot of years now is profound, like lifelong friendships, relationships, romantic relationships, and it's phenomenal. And I, I know I tell you after every Camp Fi, but I mean it. And Diana, I mean, when I came to Economy, it was so well organized. Like the quality of the event is phenomenal. And we're talking 400 people and how you can create and design it in a way where people feel brought in and introverts can have their, you know, their home of 14 people. You know, the way you design it so intentionally is so meaningful. And I brought my friend Margaret, who had never even heard about the fire movement. And I'm like, come to this thing with me. And she she loved it. And then, and then what you've done, Brad, with this Choose FI community and all the meetups, like, you know, I feel so honored to be on this podcast because I have only had one event. And so I'm just, you know, so grateful to all of you who came before me and have created this incredible community that when I, when I joined it, I was like, I'm in, this is my family. I love it. 
And yeah, I mean, I, I feel that there is something special when we get together. And I, I think about a woman who came to my event. She she reached out, never met me, and we had a couple of Zoom calls because she was nervous. And in fact, she almost pulled out. She said, "I don't, you know, I don't know anybody. I've never been to Asia. I feel nervous about going." And I didn't pressure her in any way, but I just said, you know, if you feel the call and if you feel open to coming, like we're going to be traveling together afterwards. And she ended up initially, she was just going to come for a week and a half. And I said, why don't you stay for longer? She ended up asking for 90 days off work and she's, they're still traveling together. They're still in Thailand together, this group from my retreat. So she's traveling around Southeast Asia for 90 days. And just to think about the fear of, she said, you know, for so many years, I've been saying, I want to travel more, but it was kind of scary to do it on my own. And I just had this instant ability. And now the whole world is opened. Like she sees new possibilities. She realizes that job is not really aligned for her anymore. And so, you know, she's redesigned her whole life. So it's just incredible when we go and like, as Diana said, you know, take time off, get the babysitter, you know, fly, spend the money, like being in a different environment and devoting several days to really honestly look at how are you spending your money and your time? And does it align with your values and listening to other people and learning what you don't know? Because that's what I've all the pieces I didn't know. I didn't even know how to Google that. But having those conversations around the fire at Camp Fi and in that friendship circle at Economy, you know, and the meetups that I've been to as well, it's powerful. So I just encourage listeners to have the courage to to go to something, you know, find the meetup group, find the local event, whatever you can attend. But this community is super special. Amy, that was so beautifully put. And that to me is the perfect way to close out this episode on the power of community. I could not come up with a better way if, if you gave me 10 years to describe it. So let's leave it there. Like you said, there are these, the local groups. So choosefi.com slash local. You can find there, I think last count was about 350 local groups. And like I said earlier, we're really trying to make them better, to augment with case studies and other best practices from groups and I'm taking a personal hand in this from now on. So really sign up for your the closest local group. But let's go around. And Diana, why don't you start? Tell people where to find you, how to get in touch, where the conference is, et cetera. Sure. So the next economy conference, it's in Cincinnati, Ohio. It will always be <laughs> in Cincinnati, Ohio. It is March 15th through 17th of 2024. You can go to economyconference.com and that's economy with an M-E at the end, not an M-Y. Fun little plan <laughs> words there. But economyconference.com, you can read all about the programming, the schedule, the speakers. You can sign up for our mailing list there. And if you use the discount code ChooseFi, one word, you can get 10% off tickets for the next event. So looking forward to partying with you in Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, and I will be there. So I'm very excited about uh, my second economy conference. So yeah, that should be a ball. Stephen, I know you have a bunch of events. Where can people, where's the central gathering place? Yeah, so you can go to campfi.org. So campfi.org, the schedule for 2024 is all complete and up. We'll have one in January in Florida, another one in March in Florida, uh, Mid-Atlantic, which is Memorial Day weekend. Next year, end of May, we'll have two in Colorado Springs in the summer. We'll have one in Minnesota, early September, Labor Day weekend. And then next October, we will have our 49th and 50th Camp Fi in Julian, California, which is Camp Fi Southwest. And then we'll finish out the year um, with number 50 on my birthday, October 17th Wow! in Texas, which is just in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas. So campfi.org, you can check out the whole schedule there. That is incredible. 50 events and your eighth year. That is truly, truly remarkable. And Amy, Five Freedom Retreat number two, 2024. What are the details? Or do you have them yet? Yes, I do. Five Freedom Retreats. So listeners can go to Five Freedom Retreats with an S.com. Happening November 1st through 5th, 2024 in Bali. And shout out to the Singaporeans and the Australians who came last year. You know, I'm really also creating, it's wonderful to have Americans there. And I'm really wanting to create this diverse international community where we can have these conversations and people can experience the multi-day event in Asia. So I am super excited about next year. Wow. Incredible. So five freedom retreats, plural, campfi.org, economyconference.com. Stephen, Diana, Amy, this is incredible. Thank you all for being here. 